Okay, so uh, our guest panelists. Yeah, so we'll start by introducing Dr. Teresa Hill. I'll start by saying we encountered her at a recent conference and Dr. West and I both looked at each other and said, yes, we need her to come and join us to bring her enthusiasm, her energy, her intellect, her knowledge uh, to what it is that we do here at Crest Program. She's currently serving as superintendent of the South Holland District um, 151 in South Holland, Illinois. And she's been superintendent since 2012. So you know she's got to be really, really good at what she does. Uh, she's been a teacher, a principal. Uh, she served in many, many roles as an educator and leader. Uh, we love her signature on her email, and it is, quote, all children can learn, period. Um, that just gets me right at my heart, and it tells you a little bit about her. She's also an author, so I hope that right now you're probably uh, looking to find her book, her books. She has two books, and her most recent book is Combating the Achievement Gap, ending failure as a default in school. So I hope you're all like searching for that book right now um, because I'm sure she has a lot to share about it. Um, there's a lot more here about her education and things she's done, but uh, I, I think you'll appreciate uh, her contribution when you hear her today. Absolutely. All right, and I have the honor of introducing Mr. Dolphus Graves. I'm going to do a quick little uh, intro in general. Um, so Mr. Graves used to be my supervisor. We both worked at Fulton County Juvenile Court, and that is a tribute to him that we um, had a relationship such that I would want to reach out to him <laughs> and have him, and that he would be willing to serve as a panelist for, um, you know, Crest Achieve. Um, Mr. Graves currently serves as a court administrator for the Cobb County Juvenile Court. Prior to that role, he was a director of probation services at Fulton County Juvenile Court. Uh, there are some juvenile court um, employees at Fulton County Juvenile Court employees who have logged in. So welcome. Thank you for coming. That tells you even more about him, that they want to uh, be able to hear more from him after working under him and still want to hear what he has to say. Um, Mr. Graves has been a committed public servant for 20 plus years, um, and he serves, has been appointed to, the, to Georgia's Juvenile Justice State Advisory Group and received a federal appointment at the 2019-2020 term of the Federal Advisory Committee on Juvenile Justice. He also served as an adjunct professor in the Criminal Justice Department of um, AIU here in Atlanta, and is a founder of the independent consulting agency, JAC Consulting Inc. To read more about Mr. Graves, you may have already seen his uh, bio in the Eventbrite uh, profile page. Um, you can also um, read more about him there. And uh, um, he's an also a devoted father, I have to put that on, he's a devoted father uh, to four amazing children. And so I know that that is an important aspect of who he is, and not only his professional identity, but his personal identity as well. So welcome, Mr. Graves. Just as a quick reminder, um, I think most people probably uh, who are tuning in or participating today are aware that Crest Achieve has uh, these monthly webinars, but we want to just remind you that there's a whole lot more to Crest Achieve than our monthly webinars. Um, so Crest Achieve is a credentialing program that aims to equip educators, parents, mental health clinicians, and juvenile justice professionals um, and other uh, professionals working with Black youth to more effectively promote academic excellence and emotional well-being in Black youth and other youth of color. What's unique about us is that we place culture at the center of trauma-informed care, not as an afterthought, but really um, at the core of what we do. And more specifically, we address intergenerational trauma and resilience, including healing from race-based trauma and other types of trauma that are unique to Black children and other youth of color. So how do we go about achieving these goals? Well, we do a number of different things. So we work at the, at the system level. So we work with just school districts, individual schools, uh, grade or course levels, um, and other institutions to offer training, consultation, assessments, technical assistance, and coaching for teachers, administrators, mental health providers, 
other court staff, parents, guardians, and et cetera. On the individual level, we offer videos on demand. So you can go to our Pacific site and if you're an educator, meaning teachers, administrators, other school staff members, if you're a parent or guardian, a mental health clinician or a graduate a student, you can go ahead and just access our on-demand courses that you can take there. Some of them are individual uh, webinars. Some of them are three or four part webinar series. And then also there's the Crest Achieve Credentialing Program. And if you do that today as the very last day, of course, we want to say happy uh, um, Black History Month. It's the very last day of Black History Month. Um, uh, so as part of that and our celebration of that, we're offering a 25% discount on everything that's available um, on Thinkific. And then, of course, we have a number of free resources, including these monthly webinars. We have a newsletter. We have a special communiques. We have concept papers, video, podcasts, and a whole lot more. So uh, this is the last of what you hear about Crest program uh, before we get to our panel. So I know you're, you're just waiting to hear what they have to say. I just wanna reiterate the uh, discount code. We offered this when we were at the ESEA conference. And so we thought, hey, it's the last day of Black History Month. Why don't we just give this same discount to everybody who's at the webinar today? So we're offering, we're extending that uh, discount code to you. You'll see next month, if you're with us for our webinar, that uh, we're going to have new staff. We're really excited. We've been looking for a new graduate assistant and a new social media intern, and we believe we have found uh, some, some folks to join us, so you'll get to see them. Please check out our winter newsletter and our Black History Month communique. Uh, and yeah, so in the newsletter, we talk a little bit about the conference and also about the January webinar. And then, of course, we have a save the date. So if you're joining us month after month, you can be prepared. I noticed that some people have already started signing up for the March, April, and May webinars. Uh, so that's great. And here, of course, is the save the date. It's on our website, so you can check it out. So let's get right to it. All right, so clearly we could have spent probably a whole day um, talking about the impact of COVID-19 on all of us and particularly black children. Um, but we're gonna just quickly hit some highlights. This is just examples of the ways in which black youth have been impacted across various domains from medical or physical health, emotional and behavioral, educational and juvenile justice. So we clearly could have spent more time on all of this. We really wanna to get to the discussion. So under direct effects in terms of physical health um, related issues, what we know is that black children have higher rates of COVID related symptoms and syndromes, higher rates of COVID hospitalizations and even death. Nonetheless, Black children have lower rates of COVID testing and vaccination. And that has been changing. There have been improvements. That gap has been narrowing. Uh, um, but we still see that uh, Black youth have lower rates of uh, COVID testing and vaccination. And not only in terms of their own impact, but they're more likely to have uh, parents and other family members who have, um, who have died or been severely ill uh, due to COVID. So that's a pretty significant impact just with regard to the, their physical health and the physical health of their parents and guardians. In the emotional and behavioral domain, what we're looking at are Black youth being more likely to experience increases in their anxiety and depression levels. So what we're talking about is pre-existing differences based upon race have widened um, as a result of COVID. And we'll see the same thing happening with respect to education and juvenile justice. Most notably, Black children between the ages of five and 12 have been found to have suicide rates that are about two times higher than the, than the rate for their white counterparts. And so we've already seen that among Black children and youth that the suicide rate has been increasing um, while the overall rates have been decreasing. What we've seen with COVID is that that rate has, has increased for young, I mean, that's extremely young, five to 12 is a very young age group. Um, so that's very alarming. And it's definitely worth uh, 
you know, uh, receiving attention in terms of the work that we do. From an educational standpoint, clearly, um, Black youth have been impacted as other youth have, but even more so in many ways in terms of uh, their uh, lower rates of um, access to in-person uh, uh, teaching. So they have higher rates of remote only learning, lower access to needed electronic devices or internet access, and then again, live contact with teachers. Uh, we could have talked about all the various subjects, but I just chose math really quickly. With students of color being, uh, at least at the time, or in 2020, that's what we're talking about. Um, research indicated that Black, Black students and other students of color were three to five months behind compared to one to three months behind for their white counterparts. And within juvenile justice, what we're looking at is that although the rate of youth incarcerated or, or in detention actually decreased overall, there's a widening of the, of the gap between the uh, rates of detention for Black and Latinx youth compared to their white counterparts as well. So, um, so what we're looking at is many pre-existing um, gaps in these areas actually widened as a, as the result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's just a snapshot. I'm going to kind of get things started. So while we go ahead and uh, go ahead and move on to our panel discussion, again, you know, we have Dr. Teresa Hill and Dr. and Mr. Adolphus Graves. And of course we have um, Dr. Berger, Berger, who's going to be here to help us with the q and I'm going to kind of kick us off on a positive note. Um, I'm kind of curious um, from, you know, for us to have a conversation about what do we consider to be the most rewarding aspects of the work that we do? Um, rewarding professionally, rewarding on a personal level, working with Black youth in the school or the juvenile justice or even the mental health setting. Feel free to jump in. Well, I, I can speak for the school setting. Uh, I'm currently a school superintendent. I have four schools. We serve about 1,600 students, um, about two thirds of which are uh, black students and one third are Hispanic students. Um, to me, what is most rewarding is uh, seeing everything come together as it should. There are so many things that we have to do on a daily basis, um, but there are those opportunities when you can see the students all where they should be and all learning, interacting with one another. Um, everything down from seeing children, especially after the pandemic, seeing children all together in school, um, playing together at recess, um, implementing some of those social emotional skills that they've been robbed of for the last few years. Um, down to this morning, I was at one of our schools Black History Month programs um, where students are singing and dancing and um, giving speeches and just showing their overall talent um, and understanding of the world around them. And to me, that is the most rewarding thing. There is a great deal that we deal with in schools that is not so rewarding. There are a lot of days that make you wonder if Walmart is hiring, for example. Um, but um, those are the things that make you remember why we do this. And um, that for many of our students, uh, they would never experience some of the things that we're able to do for them in schools if they did not have access to it in our schools. Okay, understandable. So that helps remind you that, okay, I don't need to worry about Walmart. <laughs> Stay in the work. <laughs> I understand that. Okay. And I'll pick up on that just a little bit. Um, you know, I am often encouraged by the resiliency of, of our people of color, of, of all cultures and nationalities, uh, especially during this time coming on the back end of the pandemic, if we can even call it that the examples of resiliency and being able to push through some extraordinarily challenging dynamics, uh, professionally, personally, uh, just being able to observe individuals really reach their peak achievement despite all these challenges that we've dealt with. And that not only applies to the children that we see 
in the juvenile justice setting, setting uh, that I work in, but also to the employees that I work with. Uh, Dr. West, you said that I was once your supervisor, but I don't look at it as that. We were colleagues and counterparts in the fight against the ills of society that were bringing way too many children to our doorsteps in that court. And I feel that same way about the folks that I work with now and always have because I enjoy and I get my strength from their resiliency at times when I'm weak, picking up on that, being able to help uh, meet the needs of those that we're serving in the court system because they come to our doors with so many uh, varying dynamics. Uh, but I'm often encouraged by the resiliency of staff and, and the uh, ideas and the brilliance that our staff bring to the table to be able to address these dynamics. Um, I'm encouraged and, and, and lifted in situations where I may be down based on some, some tough cases or some difficult you know, budget challenges or what have you by staff coming up with brilliant ideas of how to address challenges that we've been facing for decades, if not longer and uh, finding ways to kind of break through some of those, those challenges. So um, I, I'm, I'm often encouraged by watching folks around me continue to help find innovative and new ways to really uh, tackle some of these challenges in ways that I never would have been able to do as an individual, but just hope to play a small role in, in kind of leading folks to being the best version of themselves to be able to address those children and families that come to our door uh, all too often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that it, it's really good to talk about the relationships and to think about how do we relate to each other? How are the children relating to each other and how does that contribute to our ability to cope in face of these traumas that we're experiencing? And we underemphasize uh, the relationship aspect. Um, and it's usually the first thing to go. So when we're stressed, Usually we have bad relationships. So, um, and that really robs us of the opportunity to be able to come together and work toward change. So I really like hearing about that. What are some changes that you guys have seen, both positive and negative uh, during COVID? So, and just your interactions with black youth and other youth of color what, what changes, positive or negative? What have you seen? I think um, as far as interactions and relationships are concerned, I think what we have seen most, um, and we work with uh, you know children from pre-kindergarten through eighth grade. So about three years old to about 13 or 14 years of age. Um, what we have seen is just an utter yearning for um, connection and relationship. Um, the students uh, have really missed it. Um, and they, they know on a certain level that that's what they need and that's what they are missing. But at the same time, right during the time when they would have been learning how uh, to engage positively in those relationships, they were sitting at home, you know, at best behind a computer. And so um, that has been the biggest thing, you know, on the, of course, on the negative side is that they have missed some of that development. And so um, they are behind where they would typically be in the development of some of those skills. On the positive side, um, there is such a desire and yearning for it that I would say that our children and their families value it, um, I think, even more than in the past because they recognize um, what life is like without that, that constant feeling of connection and that you are, you know, that you have people around you that know you and care about you and can see you on a daily basis. Mm. On the positive side uh, in the juvenile justice uh, spectrum, and just for context, I, I just want to add this so that this isn't a Cobb County conversation, um, just to kind of bring that up, that this is a conversation that I'm having with a lot of colleagues across the, com the country um, that, that play various roles in juvenile justice. I've been blessed to have a pretty strong network of folks um, all, all across the country um, that are seeing similar issues. So this isn't a Cobb County issue and it's not a state of Georgia issue. Um, but one of the positive things that we saw 
early on in the pandemic uh, was the decline in cases to the juvenile court. Um, and in many jurisdictions, the largest number of cases that are referred to juvenile courts are for lower level offenses, uh, or what we typically refer to as the children that are disruptive more than delinquent, right? But they may be chronically disruptive, and then that turns into a delinquency filing or something of that nature. So, you know, after, you know, the pandemic kicked in, um, and you start to see the numbers creep up, you didn't, you still didn't see as many of those uh, lower level offenses being referred to the court, which to me was encouraging because I believe that a lot of individuals, whether that be law enforcement, whether that be schools, whether it be um, any of the referring agencies may have seen that there was another way to handle some of those scenarios other than sending them to the courts. So that was immensely uh, positive to see. And as some of the data pre presented a little while ago, a short while ago to Dr. West show, but now we're starting to see that increase uh, in the disproportionate uh, filing of those cases now as we're starting to get back to whatever this new normal is going to be. So uh, that that decline in those less serious cases and, and seeing the community start to take ownership of addressing some of those issues in the community without relying on the court or without triggering the court or without triggering law enforcement, that was very encouraging and something that we hope to continue to see that trend um, you know, maintain as we again come out of the backside of this. Um, so that's the positive. The, the negative, of course, was, you know, simply as Dr. Hill stated, the, the disconnect was, was tough. Um, we're seeing a lot more children that are coming to the court now um, at younger ages with a lot more seemingly anxiety, you know, on the front end. It seems like more anxiety or more uh, stress, and, and it takes a while to kind of get to the middle of that or the core of that, but also with staff. Um, you know, sitting behind these screens was tough. And I still, as, as a leader of, of staff, it's still challenging to kind of have that engagement on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're asking employees to really engage with children and families, but we're somewhat limited in being able to really engage the way that we were uh, once before. And, and although we've kind of become acclimated to using Zoom and this technology uh, to the best of our ability, and there are some benefits without question, we were using Zoom in courtrooms, uh, and that allows us to kind of reduce continuances in some instances, but it still, it, it, it makes it difficult to really get that emotional connection that sometimes you need, especially when uh, employees are facing some really tough challenges that the families are dealing with. And then to ask them to kind of pick up and do the same, uh, sometimes they're limited in having to use technology as well. We know it's not the same. Um, but again, there's some positives there as well with the advancement of, of telehealth and telemedicine and being able to do some evaluations in a more timely manner um, were some of the benefits, but there've been some negatives of that as well that I think um, some of us that are used to, I'm kind of a communal uh, leader. Like I, I need to, to see you and talk to you and watch facial expressions and watch body language and kind of know which way we're going. And, and that kind of helps me as well. So not having that has been a, a bit of a challenge and I'm sure it probably has had some negative impacts on our ability to best serve uh, some of the children and families before the court. Definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm glad to see Nicole uh, is offering some comments. We have folks who are coming from various agencies uh, who are working in communities and doing outreach to communities, developing programs in communities for black families, um, families of color throughout. Uh, uh, and so, it, yeah, feel free y'all to be able to add some of your comments about uh, what it is that you've seen in your work with youth uh, and also to offer what are some of the things that you've done to intervene. So just jump in there and be able to share just because you're not a panelist, it doesn't mean that you don't have something to offer. So I do wanna encourage y'all to just jump in there uh, and share, we all can benefit from that uh, to hear what you have to say. Uh, so I, I, I think we, we did wanna follow up on that comment that I made when I introduced Dr. Hill, uh, because it speaks to, uh, I, I think this issue of resilience and expectations that we have for black youth. 
um, and that is this, this uh, the email signature, all children can learn, period. Can you talk about that? Certainly. Um, so my, uh, my background has been really focused on um, the achievement gap and studying um, what it is and where it came from and what we can do about it. Um, and in my years of service to a variety of schools, um, what has kept coming up is this idea of, oh, we need everyone to believe that all children can learn. And so in various different schools and districts and systems, um, it's a very common refrain, all children can learn. Um, but what I have seen more often than not is qualifications on that idea. So all children can learn to their highest potential or all children can learn if the school and the community and everyone works together. And, and so there's a lot of all children can learn if, when, but, and those types of things. Um, my concern with that of course, started with the all children could learn to their potential because my question to um, my colleagues was always, and who decides what their potential is? Right. And um, for so long, um, educators, um, well-meaning though they may be, have had this idea that they could see in a five-year-old or a seven-year-old um, who and what they were going to be. Um, I shared at the beginning of our school year, um, our first institute day, I shared stories about my son, um, who's now 23 and in his first year of medical school. Um, but in third grade, I was called into one of those meetings with the principal, the assistant principal, the school psychologist, the speech um, pathologist, the OT, the PT, the nurse, and pretty much everyone else in the school. Um, a total of about 15 people and myself, where they explained to me that they thought that he had ADHD, a learning disability, um, narcolepsy, uh, <laughs> and a few other things. Um, and you know, I shared that to help people understand that when he was eight, he was eight. <laughs> um, and so there was no way for um, anyone to know what his potential was, what he could do, where he was going to go. And so those of us who are educators have to learn that when we're working with children, you know, if we're working with five-year-olds, we're working with five-year-olds. That doesn't tell us what they're going to be when they're 15, when they're 25, when they're 32. Um, and so um, that is why I always refrain back to not all children can learn to their potential, not all children can learn if, when, or any of those types of things, but all children can learn, period. So as we're thinking about what we want to do for children, we need to take out all of those qualifiers and focus on what is it that we want to make sure that our children experience, that they learn, that they have access to, and then let them take it as far as they can, um, as opposed to us having our own ideas of where they're going to end up. I'm going to piggyback on that. So it's funny when I, I remember reading, you know, uh, your statement, and I, I always hear it as all children can learn, period. That's how I hear it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like full stop. Um, I'm going to say that yes, definitely educators have to be clear that uh, they are limited in their capacity to predict who's going to be amazing and be so successful. And um, but not only educators, parents as well. I've had situations where I, as a psychologist, have done evaluations, and I'm telling a parent that their child is gifted, and sometimes they don't want to hear it. <laughs> they want me to say. A child has some sort of an issue, something's going on with them, they're weird, unusual, that kind of thing. And they may look that way because they're gifted and they're bored and they're entertaining themselves. I've had situations where, yes, I've gone to the school and I'm trying to tell them the results of my evaluation and the teachers are not feeling me. There's other teachers are not feeling that. Parents are not always feeling it. 
the last piece I'm going to say is um, in the mental health domain. I think that we think we, you know, administer these tests. And we also think we have this crystal ball where we can tell you who it's, what someone's going to be. I remember when I first started working at Fulton County Juvenile Court and I was looking over some of the evaluation reports that were coming through. And I remember there was this one statement in this uh, report that really captured it. Um, the psychologist said, and she was using it as a compliment. She was saying this particular child was one of the few children that she had assessed and her, I want to say, 10 years of doing evaluations with the court, one of the few children she had assessed that she felt had the cognitive ability to graduate from high school. And it was like, what are you saying? You feel as though the overwhelming majority of the children you've evaluated don't have uh, the cognitive skills to graduate from high school? It's like, I don't see that. That's not the children I see. I don't know what children you're seeing, but it became... If you're going into the assessment process with that thought, it's not surprising that the results that you obtain look the way they do. And so that we all have to look at our own biases across domains, even amongst probation officers. Sometimes they'll say, well, I can already tell this kid is going to end up in the adult system. And you treat that child like that. We don't necessarily know. It may be that they may have increased risk. But there are things that can be done to decrease their risk and also to provide them with protective factors. So it's like, there's still room to intervene. And it's about us not giving up hope on our children, but to be humble enough to recognize that it may look a certain way, but the truth of the matter is we don't really know. And we have to treat every child as if that's the child that's going to turn things around. And it's demoralizing when you pour a lot of resources into someone and they don't do that. But it's better to do that because with every child, rather than call yourself selecting which children are more likely to be the ones to benefit from our efforts. Dr. West, can I can I chime in just on something that you you brought to mind? You know, I think it's critical for us at this stage, following the pandemic. I I can't say it's over. I, I can't bring myself to say that at the end of the pandemic. But where we are now, I think what is critical is that we. Um, shrink the gap between school, mental health professionals, uh, primary care physicians, and the court for those who may find themselves in the court setting, right? Because mo some, again, it varies by state, but in a lot of states, juvenile courts are uniquely um, allowed by statute to order psychological evaluations regardless of their medical necessity in a way that providers would have to kind of take steps, right? Once you refer to the court, that is one of the few ways where they can automatically say, we need a psychological evaluation, a psychiatric evaluation, or uh, um, psychoeducational evaluation and can order it so, right? And what I'm working on now is trying to help encourage and support some folks in other states, as well as here in Georgia, to kind of find ways to shrink that communication so that we don't continue to uh, re-traumatize these children by exposing them to evaluations or by questions or experiences, especially coming out of the pandemic. Uh, it, it was always important that we don't uh, subject these children to, to re-traumatization through uh, unnecessary, and I only say unnecessary because unnecessary because in courts we don't always take every step possible to ensure that we gather existing information before jumping to give me this now so that I can consider that in our rehabilitative response to these behaviors. Um, and, and we gotta have it right now and we have to have this excuse or this reason or this justification, or we have to rule out certain things from a field that we're not really equipped to truly rule out behavioral health issues and mental health issues without having behavioral health professionals kind of guide our steps along the way. And a lot of courts, uh, courts are not equipped with uh, mental health professionals on staff. So I think that's critical where we are now is that we uh, shrink the communication gap between what's happening in schools and what the social workers may be aware of and the administrators who too often are used um, as attendance uh, monitors or things of that nature or um, disciplinarians solely in the school, but really trying to find ways to help engage them to have a, a different conversation with the families as well. So they're a part of this conversation. Um, 
And so we're not always just saying, okay, if we send something to the court, well, we can always bring it back and there are other options available. But once we look at it as that's where we're going to find the solution, uh, we often end up with children languishing in that system way too long and being subjected to um, something that's way more difficult to get out of than it is to get into. Absolutely. Let, Let me, me jump, also in. jump in just to um, mm -hmm. tie into that. Um, the, it's important to remember um, across these settings that the students that are in the uh, juvenile justice system are also in our schools. And so, um, you know, so schools also do not have mental health professionals. We have school social workers, which um, we have some outstanding school social workers that do a great job of school social work, but they are not psychiatrists. They are not, um, you know, many times they're not even counselors. And if we do have counselors, typically they are more along the side of educational counselors. And so when it comes down to some of the severity of trauma that some of our children have, have been, um, have experienced when it comes down to, um, you know, true uh, mental health conditions that some students are um, dealing with, um, we also do not have staff with that level of training or the ability to intervene. So often we're reading from um, an IEP or a 504 plan and the, a, a very small number of people get to see the, the full evaluation and the background and everything that's happened to a child. Um, but even that small number of people only have a limited set of resources to do anything about it. So then even, you know, in trying to work back and forth with the juvenile justice system, um, which, you know, ours in our area in Illinois, they really do try to work with us. Still, there's a lot of limitations. There's limitations on information sharing. There's limitations on what we can do. The children have to be in school, but in many tech cases, they need support at a level that is far beyond um, what we can do in a typical, you know, middle school, for example. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, Dr. Hill, we didn't talk about this, but you've completely <laughs> set us up to talk about Chris. <laughs> so, um, so it's like, so yeah, so the issue is, is that where we need to go with this is to understand that all of this stuff needs to be organic, that we can't, so there are several issues. One, yes, we need more mental health people, but we don't need mental health people bringing in outdated methods and theories and interventions that don't match black, brown, indigenous youth in our schools. So it's like, we need to be able to train people. This is why in 2020, I started this company because I've spent over two decades training people in mental health. But there is very little that is, is appropriate for children of color. And nobody is thinking about changing that at all. So when we think about bringing folks in, we have to ask, what are we bringing in? You know, are they helping? Or are they hurting? So what are we doing? So Mr. Gray, you were lucky to have Dr. West because I know her perspective and I know what she's bringing into that. So it's like, so we need to decolonize the training that we have so that when we're coming in, we are useful to folks. That's, that's number one is understanding that and equipping administrators and managers and leaders to know who is useful and who is not. When we're picking people to come in, when we're picking programs to come in, that we have the knowledge to know which are the good programs, which are the programs that are gonna be effective and helpful and which are not. We need to learn how to do that. The second piece of that is the 21st century is gonna be all about things happening from the grassroots up, not from the top down. So whether teachers like it or not, 
whether folks in the juvenile justice system like it or not, whether community people like it or not, we're all going to have to learn those basic, basic skills to help people with their mental health, right? We saw that in COVID, right? So this is my area, disasters and understanding trauma. We're not gonna have this thing where there'll be unaffected mental health people who can come in and rescue. The 21st century is gonna be all about everybody's impacted. The mental health people are stressed out, have anxiety, they got problems, right? So that whole concept has to change to one where we're a village, we're a community, and we are going to come in. Now, it, do, it doesn't mean that you don't have mental health people and they don't have expertise, but their role is very different, right? So, but the primary work and the day-to-day -day work is done by the people who are in that system. So it's about really changing that. And so when thinking about what do we want to do, what changes do we want to make? Uh, you know, I saw Raymond in the chat talking about pods. Yeah, in the pod uh, model, the people in the community rescue themselves. Now they do have assistance, but they rescue themselves. It means schools and school communities uh, rescue themselves. The parents are involved in the rescue. The educators are involved in the rescue, in the juvenile justice system. They are connected to the educators, connected to the mental health people, and they form a pod and they rescue themselves. So this is where we need to go. This is what we need to talk about in the work that we do and shy away from people who are in these silos with expertise and we just grab them when we got a problem. Um, they're not gonna understand the community the way we do. And so we need to learn how, how do we do that? Even the children, Nicole, we need to teach children about what it is that they need to do to be able to manage their anxiety, to manage their responses and so on. That is where we're headed. That is what we do here at, at Crest Program. Everything we do is all about how do we liberate ourselves? How do we do that? How do we work with people? And so on. So thank you, Dr. Hill, for setting me up to say that. <laughs> okay. Let's go to our uh, next uh, research slide and then come back to our discussion. Let me see, share my screen again. I see the chat's active. <laughs> oh yeah, the chat is active. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to say that was panel discussion one and two uh, combined. Totally. So, uh, okay. So, yeah, so let's talk about, I already mentioned that, the idea of interventions. And uh, in looking at the research, because we, we like to say, because we got such an attitude, that we like to make sure that what we're talking about is research-based, is evidence-based. So we're not just talking opinion. We're telling you about what research has shown. So the first part is, yes, you see this, this concept, African-centered interventions, ACIs. Why do we shy away from that? Why are we not using those? What, what this means is we're using interventions where the children's values are integrated, are involved, are a central part of the intervention. Why are we introducing children to other people's values? I mean, they can do it and they do do it. They do it fine, but it takes more time to learn somebody else's values and then adhere then it, it's easier when you're saying something they get, they totally understand that, right? It's like when we heard Dr. Hill talking in her presentation, she is clear, crystal clear when she talks. You get it, you understand it, you don't have to interpret it. You hear exactly what she's saying. The same thing is true for African-centered interventions. So this is what we offer to you, what research has shown. 
there's a thing called the Nguzo Saba approach. Nguzo Saba, you probably heard it around Kwanzaa time. Nguzo Saba, the seven principles of blackness. What the research showed is increased sense of communalism, social support, right? And a sense of belonging into practices, right? Into is a concept relating to balance and, and, uh, and, and using the into principles in a program, it increased students' uh, youth self-esteem and their racial cultural identity development. And then there was a program started called Journey into Womanhood and it decreased uh, pregnancy and also of uh, unprotected sex and therefore STDs. In terms of educational excellence, yeah, you know what I'm gonna say. Rites of passage programs. Rite of passage programs have been shown to be effective for a host of reasons. And we have over 20 years of research showing that it increases educational attainment. So why don't we have rite of passage programs in just about every school where there's majority black and brown children? I'm not sure. And then when we think about interpersonal harmony, where children are not being getting these behavior referrals and going into the juvenile justice system, uh, we know that rite of passage programs enhance decision making and promotes positive peer interactions. So it decreases a lot of the conflict that goes on. Uh, and then, of course, the idea of uh, there's been a lot in talking about trauma-informed juvenile justice practices and how beneficial they are. We've heard Mr. Graves talk about that. And so uh, just thinking about that, we would add, of course, culture-centered trauma-informed juvenile justice practices because we understand the uh, need for children to stay in their right minds uh, as we work with them, that they don't have to jump over to some other language or value system or anything. It's coming to them clear uh, and we get more adherence, we get more support from their family uh, because it's recognizable. What it is that we're saying is recognizable in their system. So, yeah, so I've uh, shared with you some of these uh, African-centered interventions. And uh, I would imagine that we're gonna get more interventions. There've been some interventions already placed in the chat. I'm sure Dr. Berger is gonna put some more interventions in there. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's see what the panelists have to say about that, right? So we haven't mentioned race-based trauma that forms as a multi-layered impact on black youth and other youth of color. They're already dealing with people's expectations of them, their attitudes toward them, their differential uh, ways in which our children walk in the world. And then they've got COVID-19 on top of that, right? So what are some examples of resiliency that you've seen that incorporates this idea of race-based stress and COVID? Dr. Hill, I would typically defer to you first, but I'll go first on this one. Um, so backing up a little bit, one of the shortcomings of juvenile justice in America is the lack of race-based programming and responses being funded. Okay, that typically is going to be the barrier. And one of the, the challenges that, that I enjoy engaging in is to encourage um, community-based organizations to understand the funding network and what that looks like, but then also to encourage legislators, folks that have influence at the state level and regional level, in some situations, federal level, to understand the value of adding race-based trauma response and or just culturally responsive programming that can be funded that still has the same tenets of what you traditionally fund, but includes and adds the race-based aspect to it. And it is a fight to say the least. 
um, because that funding is typically retained by larger, um, we'll just still call them community-based agencies, but larger, uh, more established agencies typically have a monopoly on court ordered or court based referrals and undoing that is is tough um so i think that conversation uh i i just did a a, a, a seminar with with another state where it wasn't about black boys and girls it was about indigenous boys and girls and latin um boys and families and cultures and what have you and it was the same conversation we couldn't get past well how do we do we take money from these programs that are typically funded and then who's actually going to offer these services who is actually qualified to offer these services and that is where that reliance on the community has to come in because it's not going to be the courts that are going to save us and being able to do that it's going to be the courts that are confident enough and brave enough to establish networks in the communities and also to encourage and support those in the communities to be able to address those those dynamics so that you don't have the court relying or we're not relying on the court to to address those challenges um because I, I agree wholeheartedly that's where we have to move towards uh even as dr hill so eloquently stated we're looking at two huge systems that a lot of people typically say y'all fix it and when i say when we're trying to encourage the community to help bridge that gap um th that's where it has to be because neither one of us are truly established or equipped to be able to do it, but we have to be brave enough to involve, empower, and equip the community to work with us and to handle that so that the children don't get lost between the school and the court and the back and forth volleying of go talk to them, no, go talk to them and what have you. And that's where that bridging, that that gap has to be. Um, I'll stop there so we can go to Dr. Hill because I know I didn't answer the question, but that was kind of, that was, that was burning a little bit. So. <laughs> That, that's a big fight that I'm engaged in with a lot of jurisdictions is that funding um, to get it away from evidence-based practices that have no uh, aspect of, of, of culture or, or race-based uh, work in, in, involved in it. Yeah, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, do like Mr. Graves and I'm gonna do my own little soapbox for a moment. Um, First, let me let me speak to the, the evidence-based practices. Um, so one of the things that I looked at in my um, my dissertation and in my first studies of the achievement gap were looking at how um, African American families view the achievement gap. And the thing that I found most of all is that the vast majority of research. Um, that is out there on what is evidence-based does not uh, focus at all on uh, Black children, um, children of color, um, English language learners, et cetera. Um, and so the evidence-based, many of the evidence-based practices, even in education, are based on evidence about other people's children, um, as Lisa Del Pitt would have put it. Um, and so, um, whereas there may be some of those practices that cross over, um, there has been precious little uh, research on practices that are truly focused on meeting the needs of Black children, um, of other children of color, um, which means that uh, some of the things that uh, we um, as educators that we as practitioners know work, don't have the evidence-based label um, because that research has not been done and there's not been that level of focus on the research for our populations of children. And so that often gets in the way because in order to try to apply for a grant, uh, you know, a competitive grant, you have to prove that it's evidence-based, but the evidence that you have is focused on um, actual practice and experience, and many times does not have that level of backing in um, the quote-unquote formalized research. Uh, and so that is an issue. And I will, I, I know that I probably have contributed to that because there are times when people will want to do research on um, our children and um, 
my job is to ensure that they are getting the best. And so if there's any possibility that whatever is being researched is not what's going to be best for our children, then we don't participate. And so there's kind of a, a double-edged sword there um, as it relates to the evidence base of um, you know, any kinds of those funding streams. Um, but then also just in general, to me, the biggest thing that has impacted um, our children, our families, as it relates to the pandemic is um, what I would characterize as a collapse of the village. Um, all of the, you know, schools have not been um, perfect systems by any means, um, especially at serving our uh, Black children and youth. Um, that being said, what things they did well uh, was broken during the pandemic. When we went into lockdown, when in the state of Illinois, the governor called and said, oh, by the way, you're going to be closing schools in three days. Um, all of those connections, supports, um, abilities that we had to work with our children was taken away from us. Uh, so even in a school district like mine, where we provided everyone with laptops, we provided everyone with internet access, um, let's face it, no amount of speaking to someone over the computer is the same as being able to interact person to person, build those social skills, interact with others. Um, you know, trying to learn how to read as a first grader through a computer um, is very, very difficult. And so that lack of the village, not being able to go see grandma or being at grandma's house with all of your siblings and all of your cousins trying to do remote learning because your parents are, um, you know, essential workers and still have to go to work. Um, losing family members of which we talked about, you know, so many of our families did. Um, all of those traumas took place while also um, taking us away from our village, whether the small family village, the community village, the ability to talk amongst ourselves, bring parents together. Um, all of those things were huge. And so, you know, the biggest thing for us now for resilience in my mind is to rebuild that, to rebuild that sense of village, to make sure that every single child still has that, even if they've lost people, even as they've experienced trauma. Very nice, very nice. Uh, thank you so much. I gave you several little hearts going up as you were talking uh, to let you know, definitely you're um, preaching to the choir here. Um, we definitely agree with you. I do want to offer to you and to other folks who are listening that uh, one of the things that happens as we go through these systems in getting our education is that um, the, uh, the understanding about what's out there is often given to us by faculty who don't know. So I remember when many, many years ago, decades ago, when I was working toward my doctorate. And I remember going to my uh, advisor and I was talking about, you know, race-based stress back then, back in the 1990s, I was talking about race-based stress. And my advisor looked at me with all honesty and I would say even love. This is someone who is still a mentor to me today white male and said to me, well, Cerise, there, there's no one writing about that. You, you can't build your dissertation. Fortunately, I had already been going to the Association of Black Psychologists Conference and I had been meeting these scholars and been reading their work, empirical studies. So I knew that wasn't true, right? But I was an older student going through, I, I already, it had some sense of what was out there and what I was doing. So I could just look them in the eye and appreciate this person that they were giving me a gift. They thought with love, with care, but it wasn't true. So I just said, thank you very much. And then kept going with what I was doing. So 
when I came into the academy, one of the things that I did is work with students to have them to go beneath the surface because that surface research is gonna tell you your people are not writing about this. And that's not true, they are, but they are underneath the surface. So I taught them how to go beneath the surface. So I offer, Dr. West and I, I know she agrees with me, we offer the opportunity to work with you and show you the empirical studies that you can use in your grant proposals, that you can use in designing your programs. We can help you to do that. Now, that's not the same thing as what Mr. Graves is talking about. It's about when you have it in there and they don't wanna fund you because it's in there. That's a different matter. Uh, and is one that can be addressed um, but it does take more strategy development. I talk about Burr Rabbit in the chat and I'm not off topic. Talk about Burr Rabbit in there about how we need to do that. But Dr. Hill, what you're talking about, we can, we can help you with that. We can show you empirical studies that you can include and you can use those instead of those other things to build a strong culture-centered foundation for working with your Latino youth, for working with your Black youth, so that you have that. We can help you to find that. There are lots of studies, they're just not acknowledged. Yes, and I, I do think that that, um, that type of thing will be particularly helpful, not just for, you know, for myself, um, because we, we get a lot of funding through um, you know, federal grants and different things like that. Um, but just in general, I mean, as you, as I'm sure you are aware, um, most educators, you know, don't don't even necessarily have a, a, a doctoral degree, and so haven't had that level of research. So many times when we're looking for research to support some of the things we're doing or to plan things out, we're going to um, places where um, the quote unquote traditional research is what's put forth. So the, you know, the what works clearing house and those types of things are where most educators, because, you know, we're teaching all day. <laughs> so when we're, when we're working on a grant, we're doing that, you know, in the evening or Sunday morning before church or different things like that. And so, um, but having those resources out there where people can know about them, where they can be shared. I think will be um, particularly helpful um, to a variety of people who, you know, really do want to do what's best um, for Black children, um, but don't always know what what's best is, and um, certainly don't always have the resources. Love it, love it, love it, love it. We're going to turn it over to Megan, to Dr. Berger. Persia and uh, have her to manage. Uh, there have been some questions in the chat and there have been some questions in the Q&A. So Dr. Berger. Yes, um, so I would like to begin and um, I'm gonna apologize now because um, this, this participant also let me know it's a long question. So I am gonna do a little bit of paraphrasing but I wanna stay true to their question. Um, during the pandemic, there were several great ideas that could have present, prevented some of the isolation. Um, Dr. Hill mentioned the giving away or giving the laptops to increase access. Um, there were some community and neighborhood pods, but many families didn't have the bandwidth to make this happen. Do you all think that community and local state leaders could have done a better job at implementing these innovative ideas? And if or if not, what could happen in the future to make sure that these innovative plans do come to fruition? Okay, so I, I'm assuming that that's one for me. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so I know that, um, in my mind, the biggest problem with what uh, took place was that it was um, pretty much entirely dependent, uh, at least in the state of Illinois. It was entirely dependent on what each individual school district um, or school decided to do and what each individual school district or school had the resources to do and what they were willing to do and the trust they had um, between them and their community. So, you know, in our school district, yes, 
we purchased laptops. Thankfully, we we put in that order early enough that we were able to get them in time. We purchased laptops. We purchased hotspots. Um, we had already been doing some of that uh, through some some grant funding previously, um, but we basically went all in on that. So we provided all of that kind of thing. We worked with our teachers to move to online teaching and learning, and we did synchronous, um, basically full day instruction with our kids for our families. That being said, we did that because pretty much that's what I decided to do and my board backed me up. Um, we had neighbors that did not do any quote unquote remote learning. They copied packets of paper, sent them home to families, and that was what the students would have for an entire quarter of the school year. And so um, to me, the biggest failure was that, um, you know, that it was completely dependent on what each district decided to do. We happened to have the resources and to be able to do that, um, you know, to what I felt was the minimal level of what we should be providing for our students. But literal neighbors a few blocks away had nothing similar to that. And so um, I think for the future, the idea of really making sure that we have a true understanding of what are the resources that our schools have um, and what are the resources that our communities have and to establish what is the baseline of what students should be able to receive in the case of this kind of uh, situation. Um, because, um, you know, we talk all the time, we did more than almost anybody else in our South Suburban area, um, but we had the resources and quite honestly, the will to do it. Um, and so going forward, you know, should heaven forbid something like this happens again, we need to establish what is gonna be the foundational level of uh, support and resources that our children are going to receive. Thank you, Dr. Hill. And it's really the will and the resources, but that the will to get to the resources. And I see Mr. Gray shaking his head um, intensely. So I'm curious in a juvenile setting. Now, while we were looking at uh, community pods and community Wi-Fi, is there something, are there plans that could have taken place in a juvenile setting that might not have been able to um, come to fruition or what could be done in the future? Absolutely. I, I wanted to underscore the, the, the will to do it that Dr. Hill um, stated, but probably humbly uh, didn't do it justice, like her leadership, being able to say that this is important, that we get out to the community and that we get these resources out to our, our, our families and children, I think is important. And it's an important reminder, that the value of knowing who your leaders are in communities, especially in schools and at different local levels as well. Um, we, I, I believe, could have done a better job in focusing on, in the juvenile justice system, um, getting to parenting resources quicker. Um, I, I think we, we kind of, we were able to be nimble in adjusting how we made community-based site, site visits, uh, switching over to doing some telehealth and things of that nature for certain resources and groups and programmings. But I believe that we missed the mark in some instances on how we engage with parents and families um, in, in a similar way or in a similarly um, unique way or, or creative way is a better way to state it. Um, I, I, as many of us can remember, think of, I have four kids, I have four children and uh, I'm blessed that my wife still allows me to be her husband, but we were trying to raise four kids, um, both telework and do high school work, middle school work, um, elementary work and pre-K work. And when I tell you, and we moved from Gwinnett County to Cobb County in the middle of the pandemic. And we needed some help. We needed resources. We still ain't right. Let me just put it that way. We still ain't right. Uh, we still are struggling through it, but I think we missed the mark on working with our justice involved families to kind of give them more support and resources in, in dealing with the changes that we saw taking place with the children and families. Thank you, Mr. Graves. 
Um, I think we have a little bit more time for questions. Um, we often get asked this question. I haven't heard it in the chat yet, but I'm going to ask it. If I'm a teacher, parent, clinician, or juvenile justice professional, what can I do today or this week to promote academic excellence and emotional well-being in Black youth who have been negatively impacted by the pandemic? I'll say um, to make sure that we we don't uh, minimize the value of what Dr. West Olatunji stated in that we all need help. Um, I, I think that's something that we, we need to have that humility to understand the impact of the pandemic on our ability to not even just do our own jobs uh, the way we did before with the same proficiency and the same um, you, you know, uh, success, but to be everything, how we actually parent, how we um, engage extended family members and how we tend to and address the needs of, of our immediate family members in addition to trying to help other folks through our professional role. I, I think you can't uh, understate the importance of doing such. Um, you know, identifying ways in which we can, you know, she stated that everybody's gonna need help. <laughs> the therapist is gonna need help. <laughs> that was that was simply stated, but it was so profound. Um, and I think acknowledging that and, and being humble enough and honest enough with ourselves to identify ways in which we can get our own race-based um, you know, support as the adults that are trying to help lead these children and families uh, on this end of the pandemic. Um, I, I think that's important. As we always talk about the need of that for our children, we need it ourselves. Um, so finding uh, therapists, professionals that can address that and, and really pushing back on that stigma that we have in our communities about um, let's not talk about it, let's not address it, and let's keep pushing like it's okay. And I think that also is gender specific. Uh, we need men's, black men's health uh, and wellness support um, it, just as much as we need black women's health um, and wellness support. Um, so I think being brave enough to, to acknowledge that um, and, and, and be humble enough to know that we need that to really be able to impact and help other people uh, through, through our profession. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Um, we have a question in the chat. Have you had much trouble fighting districts and to bring in culturally competent curriculum and services? And if so, how do you address it? How do we overcome these challenges? Because we know that there's a need for evidence-based culture-centered work, but um, it's almost like, folks just want to close their eyes to it. So how are we overcoming um, the challenges to bring in culturally competent services and curriculum? Okay. And I think um, this is for any, any one of our um, panelists. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Okay. Um, I would say in, in my area, you know, we have been blessed because, um, you know, when we look at the population of our students and, and working with our community, there's a great deal of support for, um, you know, cultural competence, cultural relevancy. Um, and um, so we have not had to, you know, fight a battle as it relates to that. Um, I, I do think here's a good place to put in that the um, the the ongoing attacks um, recently um, from uh, parts of the political spectrum uh, against uh, learning about racism, learning about um, the um, issues that impact our children. Uh, are things that we, you know, see and and constantly monitor, um, and those are things that I think it's critically important that all of us, even those of us that don't have to face it directly within our own individual settings, um, that we are uh, upfront and clear about uh, what we need to do. This this work, um, there's nothing about this work that should be hidden. Um, and, um, you know, we need to continue to, um, to speak to uh, and fight for the importance of uh, the work that we do with Black children and, and children of color more generally, um, because uh, it is very much under attack. Um, and, you know, whereas right now it's kind of a, 
um, you know, a political talking point. The uh, issue is that when it's no longer front page news, the impact of um, pulling back of all of these resources and ways of thinking about serving our children tends to linger for many years afterward. So it's just critically important that we speak um, clearly about that, uh, you know, certainly about Black history, um, but not just about Black history, about the fact that um, not only is it okay for us to speak to the unique needs of Black children and children of color, um, but that that is uh, our absolute responsibility and that we have to bring forward those needs um, while we can see that that there are some different needs um, based on the outcomes that we see from our children. Mm, so even us today, we can start to document and, and record what we see and let our observations become the evidence until we begin generating um, more of what we need. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Do you all have, for our panelists, do you all have any final comments that you would like to leave with our audience and share with our audience before we um, depart? Um, you know, I the biggest thing that I would like to um, really focus on is that idea of um, the best thing we can do for our children is really focus on rebuilding the village. Um, making sure that we build the connections, um, not only between the organizations and the fields, you know, so there's juvenile justice and schools, but also with our community organizations, with our churches, with our um, youth groups, um, with our parents, with our families, re focusing in on rebuilding those connections so that we can make sure that every child um, has that access to multiple people for whom they are the most important thing in the world. Um, we know they're the most important thing in the world to, to mom and dad, you know, uh, you know to, their, to their parents, to their grandparents, but making sure that, you know, we are supporting each other um, and bringing together the resources that we have to bear. That is something huge that you know we had to put a pause on. And now we've got a lot of catching up to do to rebuild those connections. Um, the other thing that I would just say in, in general for everyone who does this work is that there is no finish line. Um, you know, there's, there's stuff that we have to do for this particular child, this particular group of children right now. Um, but when they move on, there's another group that is going to need those same kinds of things. And so we have to recognize that the work we do is ongoing and we have to continue having these discussions, building up the supports um, for our children and youth um, so that um, we can establish what is needed for them in the future. The one other last point I just wanted to make is um, a recognition that, um, as I said before, the children and youth that are in the juvenile justice system are in our schools. Um, the young and older adults who are in the adult justice system are the older siblings, cousins, parents of our children in schools. And so that also has a huge impact on the family life um, the children and the trauma that they experience. And so being able to build those connections across the board I think is, is really important work for us going forward. And, and I'll try to be succinct. Um, equip the village and educate the village, right? Like now more than ever, we need to ensure that the village has an understanding of what's happening to our children whether they are in school, uh, in the communities, and unfortunately sometimes involved with the juvenile justice system. And also remember that the juvenile justice system is not just about delinquent behavior. It's about sometimes running away, non-delinquent, non-criminal activity. It's about ungovernable behavior. It's about children that have been abused and neglected. Uh, most juvenile justice systems, probably about 50 to 60% of our casework is around working with DFACs regarding dependency cases where children have been alleged to have been abused and neglected. 
And there's a space where that crosses over, where those children that have been abused and neglected and molested and uh, assaulted by family members then become those that are too often the most acceptable to being participating in uh, deep end criminal activity, right? Understanding those dynamics that the hurt that they've experienced is also what we see as the, the symptom of the illness that's underneath and underlying um, and equipping our village to, to take a role in ownership of that and uh, take a role in that healing that has to take place as opposed to relying on the schools and as phenomenal as uh, Superintendent Dr. Hill is that she can only do but so much with the limited time that she is with those children and understanding the value of the community taking hold of those children and addressing the challenges that they may be facing, especially as it relates to what they've experienced in spaces of isolation and voicelessness during the pandemic, where there was no school social worker or counselor or principal or superintendent to say, I'm hungry, can you feed me? Or to say, I'm hurting, can you help heal me? Or to say, I'm sad, can you try to make, make help me uh, to, to be happier? And that they were in isolation in their communities and the ones that I'm most concerned about are not the ones that refer to the juvenile court because we can put our hands on them and help hopefully untie the juvenile justice system. It's the ones that were in communities where no one called the police. And it's the ones in the communities where they were raped and assaulted and experienced trauma. And there was no outlet to say, help me process this, right? So understanding that we're not gonna take care of that as a court and feeding them to a court system and a juvenile justice system that too many times if there's not a, a bright sign that says exit this highway, that the adult system is up ahead and we don't guide these children off of that highway, that too many of our children will face that system if we don't understand the limitations of that system and take hold of that as a community. So I'd say equip and educate the village and, uh, and continue to support work like what you all are doing here. This is phenomenal. The, the platform, the work that you all are doing. Um, and I'm just honored to be a part of it and and, and hopefully uh, to be able to continually support what you all are doing because it is much needed in, in our communities. Hmm, let the church say, amen. You're preaching, <laughs> preaching. Woo! All right. Thank you so much. We're already getting lots of thank yous in the chat. Uh, folks are really appreciated what you brought today. Thank you. Um, we are down to the last three minutes. Uh, Dr. West, did you want to um, just share your slide or? Um, talk Very quickly, because we only had three minutes and I know, don't, please everyone, please remember to complete the post webinar survey. So let us know what you liked and, and any suggestions about future topics to get feedback to all of us, especially our panelists who have taken time out of their schedules um, to share this information with all of you. And so we really would appreciate that. Um, there's a quick slide. I'm going to just whiz right through it. We've covered a lot of it already. We always talked about rights and passage programs. We talked about the need for mental health professionals to really use um, Afrocentric theories and uh, therapeutic interventions and for us to be able to get funding and to be able to uh, utilize research that has already been done out there to be creative about how we um, find those research studies and how we utilize that, re both that research in order to really focus on an area that has really not been addressed as much as it should be, which is how does culture uh, play a role in all of this? How does race-based trauma play a role? What about the whole family? Someone, one of the uh, participants had mentioned a holistic approach. Uh, that Mr. Graves mentioned that. I know that Dr. Hill talked about that. That is about really what's going on within the family, what's going on within that community, and being able to look at that, that some of the children that come before us who, uh, it may be a sibling of theirs that has an issue, maybe mom and dad have an issue, it may be a symptom of what's going on in the school system. And so we want to be able to identify what's really going on and what's, what are the driving forces to the behaviors that we're seeing or the emotions that we're seeing and to be able to address them from a culturally centered uh, approach. Um, we're going to move right along. I've provided you with some resources about some Afrocentric rite of passage programs. Um, I know that Mr. Graves, I think, is going to share some resources as well if he gets a chance to do that. We only have a couple of minutes. Um, let's move on to the next slide, Dr. Westolatunji. Of course, March 21st, we're going to be talking about LGBTQ issues. And of course, a lot of this um, 
it does apply to not only just Black youth, but for youth who are members of this community, they are at increased risk for all sorts of other things. So we talked about bullying in the schools, and so we're talking about um, increased risk for um, mental health related conditions based upon things that they experiencing in the home setting, the school setting, and the juvenile justice setting, et cetera. So we want to be able to address uh, their needs as well from a culturally centered approach. And you can go ahead. People have already started uh, registering for this event. Um, we also have uh, our May events already in Eventbrite, which is about uh, promoting uh, transgenerational uh, resilience in Black mothers. And so if you want to go ahead and do that, yes, somebody brought up suicide prevention. We did do a uh, uh, a webinar um, on suicide prevention in Black men and boys. That was uh, a couple of months ago, but you can access that on our YouTube channel. You can get access to that. And that was an excellent webinar, one of our best, without a doubt. Um, so um, definitely take advantage of the resources that we have in Thinkific. Remember, we have that discount code of 25% off if you use it today, which is the last day of Black History Month. I'll go ahead and do that, and that'll give you 25% uh, off. That's something that you can do to go ahead and increase your knowledge, whether you're a clinician or a parent, an educator, juvenile justice professional, et cetera. And uh, we just thank you, all of you, our panelists, you. Dr. Hill, Mr. Graves. We thank, uh, thank Mr. Berger, who's been here helping us with the Q&A, did an amazing job as always. And of course, we always thank all of you, those of you who, for whom you come on a regular basis to our webinars and have participated in our trainings. And for those of you who are brand new, welcome to the Crest program and Crest Achieve family. And that's it. And so if I'm lucky, I'll be able to play our jingle going out. As we always say, we love you very much, but we got to go. Uh, and we'll see you next month. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And we hope to see you next month. Take care. <laughs> awesome. Take care, everybody. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.